right, our next uh, score is by Tibo and um, under the pen name of Eusebius, which makes me wonder um, if there's also a Floriston out there scoring things, or if, if you have another persona scoring along those uh, aesthetic uh, lines or observations. Anyhow, I just, I think that this score is just the soul of elegance. And it just really, you know, I, I don't know if it's a, an, like a Ravel approach so much as it just is a really like nicely thought out um, it, for the most part, very nicely balanced and, and colorful score. So uh, before I give too much more away, let's have a listen to it now, and then I'll give some comments, um, some overall comments, which I've, I've got a lot to say about it. Um, you know, a few, a few suggestions and corrections and other things, but, uh, but mostly just like uh, observing some of the really fine characters and qualities of this score. So here we go. So wasn't that awesome? Okay, um, let's continue on. Now, I just want to apologize if you hear any um, sort of hammering or sawing uh, sounds in the background. My neighbor's doing a remodel to her house. This is a different neighbor. If you've been following along the uh, <laughs> the woes, this is actually an incredibly quiet neighborhood. Uh, but, you know, every few months somebody does a remodel on their house. So uh, we're all... Even I did that recently. So, yeah, so apologies if you do hear some banging around. All right, uh, so, so yeah, so you could hear that, that there are just so many fun features to this, like um, the way that the bassoons stick out here, and they don't sort of slavishly follow the second beat of the regular bass pattern, right? That was one really cool uh, thing. And another one was the um, the... I keep wanting to say altos. <laughs> Everybody's just writing French, uh, you know, kind of old school uh, uh, French instrument names. Viola um, here, um, you know, tracking what's going on here with the first clarinet. Uh, that's just really, really nice. And um, and you know, English horn solo. I how can I um, how can I argue with that? That's what I did. It was used a uh, English horn solo. So this is this is very, um, you know, just a very sweet way to start. And it, it you know, I, I mean, I, I do have some issues with with these long, long phrases and so on. And I've 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 talked at length about them in many other uh, evaluations. So I will just leave it alone for now. But just you know, just so you know, you could be uh, shortening some of these slurs and using the the um, the articulation of the slurred groups as a form of nuance, right? Okay, um, and yeah, there there are kind of like you know there could be more nuances, more hairpins here and there on different parts, but yeah, but but elegantly done all the same. 
I like the the way that this sort of rises to, you know, just a regular old piano, and you don't even bother mentioning where we're going with the English horn, and that's fine. Here we're going to octave uh, atu flutes uh, with the English horn, and that is a beautiful sound. Um, it's it's nice because there's a slight um, uh, there's a slightly edgy quality to the uh, to flutes a two which are which is going to be um, is going to catch the way that the English horn has like a, a bit of a rough overtone up here right so this is going to work very very nicely and then of course you know bassoon and clarinet continue on with their little accompaniment I thought this was really effective as well with the uh, horns coming in and doubling the clarinets at pianissimo. Um, that's very nice. And then, of course, just very elegant little touches by the harp. So that's what I meant by this being the soul of elegance. It really, you know, just does have, have a beautifully delicate and refined approach right from the very first page. Now, we continue on. Um, the only thing that I will say is that if this flute octave does more than just radiate above the English horn, then you are giving away the fact that this starts off an octave higher than than the uh, than the or original statement, right, of the first theme. So so you know so this is no surprise. This is no contrast in terms of register, right? It's just basically the same exact uh, orchestral register as where the flutes left off, right? So um, that's something to think about. Now, I like the way that things simplify rather than getting more complicated. That is a very, very nice feature. Flute is sort of taking over uh, for what the bassoon did before, these little notes that are not part of the, of the accompaniment strategy. And this is really lovely, okay? Um, it's, it's a way of sort of spreading out that boom, boom, boo, dee, beep, boom, boom, boo, dee, beep. All right. I felt, I mean, it could have been a little bit more plainly stated. If you if you're doing this in the harp anyway, I kind of missed it afterwards. I was thinking, oh man, where's the harp coming in? You know, for you know, could couldn't it do some of what's going on here? But but you are compensating quite nicely with uh with the pizzicato here, so that's no problem. And <clears throat> this little doubling here with the violins coming in, um, that's a nice way of easing into it, but you know, you know that it's not going to just gradually become clarinet, right? It, you would have to really start from a triple P if you wanted to just gradually have the strings insinuate themselves into the clarinet timbre. So it would just really have to be balanced a little bit differently. And then you'd have to both come up to the same, you know, you would have to say, okay, um, you know, piano crescendo, and this would have to be, you know, I would say you'd have to mark this destination uh, as like piano at least, all right? And this is nice, just this kind of very cool, very, very clear uh, harmonization by the, um, by the winds. It's very, very nicely done. And I love this little horn thing in here. And as I'm starting to point out now is that there is a slight puzzle to the end here of, of how to put things together so it comes to an end. Um, and and um, I feel that's nicely done. This is all just very beautifully elegant here. Okay, and I like this plick, 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 but I miss it here. It's like, oh, where to go? You know, just because the harmony changes here doesn't mean that you have to stop the rhythm, right? So I felt, you know, you could have continued on a bit of a pulse, but that's all right. Easing off allows this um, this to come in a little bit more individually to sort of con contrast with what's coming before, Okay. So, so, so far, pretty nice. Now, all right, bassoon tremolo. So are you really sure that you want a uh, flotterzungen right there? You know, let's, what's the... You know, I mean, it's hard to do for a bassoonist, and it, it doesn't really have that great of a sound. Perhaps you wanted to match the uh, the sound of the uh, tremolo violins uh, and that divisi. Um, you know, just not quite sure. I, and I was also wondering why this couldn't have been cello, and then you could have had 
the violas grab the bottom note of this so the divisi wouldn't have to be spread so much across the uh, first violins. Or you could have just had like uh, cello, violas, right? They can go up to G flat in pizzicato quite well. And then split this up between first and second violins. Anyway, uh, you know, just just throwing chords into a string part. I always, I always really want to think about that before I do it. <clears throat> now here, more, uh, more flatterzungen, and I think that you know, if you really want to be European about it, you have to go right, F L Z, F L Z, short for flatterzungen. I think that's better than saying tremolo, right? Uh, let's drop this here. All right, and then it's not enough just to say that. You should say this. <clears throat> All right, I think that it just really is important to put in, you know, to add the triple beams. <clears throat> I, I am totally not a fan of writing the word tremolo and then just letting the players handle it and then come in with nat or ord or norm to cancel it. I think you really need to just mark it out, you know, because like, it's okay here where you've got the change right next to a um, a rehearsal mark. But what if it was way back here, right? And then you're going to get your part back. And then you might get the part back with just like slashes on it right here. Like, you know, say, hey, remember, right? So, so yeah. So just really, I would say, just mark every single note <clears throat> that you intend to flutter tongue. All right. I'm still not a big fan of flutter tongue on bassoon, but... <coughs> Forgive me. <clears throat> All right, moving on. We've got this um, unison octave here. It's actually, um, <clears throat> it's oboe plus two flutes and English horn an octave lower. So that's quite, you know, that's quite a bit of weight on that top line. You know, wondering if it really needs one of those elements there, you know, either flute or oboe, you know. Um, and then here you've got, um, you've got your octave violins and viola with, um, you know, doubled by flute on the top, but not by anything below, right? So the violas have got no support. And I'm just wondering, you know, is, is, was there, you know, is there some way that you could have done this a little differently with some other, you know, wind instrument covering this part? Uh, just, just a thought there. But I mean, I do like the structure of everything else. Or, or could, um, could a brass instrument have covered one of these notes uh, so that like maybe the oboe could have doubled or the English horn could have doubled this uh, viola line? <clears throat> Anyhow, nice... Uh, nice little horns, nice trumpets in there, and I like the swooping down. That's something that I did myself, all our gondo. And I like the fact that you, um, you did a bit of, like I was saying, conducting, like, you know, managing the tempo of things. I don't know if a cello rondo here is what to do. Maybe even slowing down even more, and then going back to your tempo mark here. Uh, check out how I did mine, if you haven't already. Um, and, you know, just to, just to see how things, uh, you know, you can, <clears throat> you can sort of see this as like a, um, like a tailing off, right? And then coming back to the tempo here rather than jumping back to it or pushing back to it. Okay. So that leaves us <clears throat> at this massive appassionato section. And, uh, you know, we've got, let's, let's work our way from the bottom up now. All right. So we've got bassoons, tuba and bass trombone and cellos and double basses. Quite big sound, but it's good that you're balancing things at forte. Now I would say you should balance your trumpets at forte as well, rather than fortissimo. <clears throat> because if you put this high C on a fortissimo appassionato, 
That's all you're going to hear, right? You're basically um, playing the same note as this uh, flute here and the second violin there, right? And and you it will be audible in terms of, of strings there, but I just, you know, I kind of feel like we need more strings, right? Um, so you could actually do octaves here on the uh, on the second violins uh, and have like a triple octave of strings to fit the triple octave, you know, flute and trumpets. And this is just a really firm, piercing sound of these um, of these elements here. But yeah, but your trumpets do not need to be fortissimo. They will be fortissimo compared to the strings and winds if they just play F. Okay, now there's quite a bit of weight given to the counter melody, right? Your counter melody is just everywhere, right? You're, it's, you've got a triple octave for your counter melody, which you don't have in your strings. And that triple octave in the winds is doubled by horns and trombone, uh, you know, and violas, right? So it's just huge weight on the counter melody. Um, and I like the timpani roll. That's very cool. But there's where, you know, I mean, don't you need a little diminuendo there? And just to come off of it a bit. I feel like the new tempo, sorry, the new, um, the new dynamic is here rather than, you know, you know what I mean? I feel it's, it's here. Now you do not need to bring... You do not need to turn this into a foreground element. You can mark everybody mezzo forte, okay? Or you could mark the um, the brass mezzo forte and the winds uh, and strings forte, right? Just to con maintain your balance there. It's neat that you have the trumpet kind of soloing there. So I would just say, you know, maybe solo. I don't know. You, you have to you have to tell us if this is. See, you, you took pains to say that this is ah too, but who's this? First, second, both, right? We need to know. But yeah, but very, this is going to be a very firm, very solid melody going down there, okay? And then I like the fact that it just gives over to bassoons right there. And, you know, somehow, I, I don't think you need these slurs on your trombone part, okay? Um... You know, maybe slurring each pair of notes, but I mean, it's it's almost like I mean, trombones don't really slur; they give the appearance of slurring. But if they were to actually really, um, you know, change positions with their slide whilst continuing to uh, to blow their breath uh, into the um, into their mouthpiece, then you would hear all sorts of very strange sounds, right? So they don't really actually slur. So I'm just saying, like, you know, maybe avoid adding slurs to trombone lines unless they really are playing some a very cantabile melody and you want to sort of guide them in terms of phrasing but you know don't don't overdo it on slurs of the trombone i got to make that into uh into a uh, orchestration tip don't overdo it with slurs on trombone um but yeah see like you've got slurs in your cello part so that's good enough right that's all you need the trombone can just double that and not worry about it Okay, and, you know, what's going on with the bassoons? Is this a two? Is this a solo? Right, it's really important. A two would work fine doubling the violas. So that's my guess. Okay, and this is nice, but why not, if you're going pizzicato here, why not go staccato here with your bassoons, right? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, just a thought there. And then horn solo. And this really needs to be cut way down. You know, you're asking the horn player to go Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, right? And same thing with the trumpet, man. You're asking them to go pianissimo slurring up to uh, up to high G. <laughs> now, you can control up to G quite quite well with the dynamics, but I mean, yeah, just just break that down a little bit. Break that slurring down a little bit. Lovely harp here. I really like that. <clears throat> and this is cool. Dun, da, 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 da. Bum, 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 bum. Now this is just too much, uh, too much tweaking on the, um, on the dynamics. You know, you can have your foreground voice P and your and your uh, accompanying voices pianissimo if you'd like, or you don't even need to do that. You could have everybody playing softly, like everybody playing the same dynamic 
but just the tone weight will be given to the the solo instrument, right? And and actually remember that in the original score, this is mezzo forte and this is answering piano, right? And once again, you know, this is Flotterzungen, so we might as well just mark it, right? And uh, you know, once you've marked one Flotterzungen FLZ in the score, then that is all you need to mark, right? You actually don't even need this, right? If 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 the player has already done Flotterzungen, then they will just recognize this for what it is. In fact, they might not even need you to mark FLZ. Yeah, and uh, tremolo, have you heard tremolo clarinets or tremolo uh, English horn? It's really, you know, those are just stinky sounds. I mean, they're just really like... It's just really not an elegant, beautiful sound. Sorry, I mean, that's my taste coming through here, but... You know, huh, I just would set my teeth on edge if I heard that. You know, especially cor anglais and bassoon both playing tremolo, I would just really feel like almost like the end was razzing me, right? So this is where the delicacy breaks down. The assumption that the flutter tonguing will be an elegant, beautiful, wispy sound. Well, it is on flute in certain ways at certain dynamics. But I just don't think it works for uh, reed instruments in, in an elegant way at all. So, you know, that's my judgment on that. You can take it or leave it. Now here, I think that actually, why not start the tremolo here? And why not spread this out across three instruments, right? Rather than just giving the chords to, you know, just to the first, the seconds and then the firsts. You know, couldn't the viola take the bottom notes, right? If these are all harmonics, which really should be written out as artificial harmonics, right? Um, then you could give this note right down here to the cellos. And then just split these three voices in these chords across uh, viola, violin, and for, uh, and sorry, viola and first and second violins. This is nice. Boo -doo 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 -boom. Ching. Yeah, that's all fun. So yeah, so so I felt that this um, you know this score was another one that was pretty close to being put on the stands, but it just you know it needed a few a few key edits to get it ready. And um, I, you know I just I just thought that the vibe was very well worked out. Just what what needed to be said had been thought over pretty carefully. So I enjoyed this, and you know would love to see more of your orchestrations in future challenges. Thanks so much.